Well, a trade war between the U.S. and China may yank the world into a nasty recession. Real fears about that. But is that the only offshore threat that could take over this coming election year? What about our own deteriorating relationship with China? And what about the U.S., where now the Democrats are threatening to cancel the new NAFTA deal and don't discount meddling in the upcoming federal election. To talk about the foreign affairs factor in the election year, let's bring back the scrum. Tonda McCharles and Bob Pfeiffer here. Craig Oliver is back, of course. And our special guest for this round is the former CSIS director, former national security advisor to both Mr. Trudeau and Harper, Dick Fadden. All right, good to have the scrum back. And Dick Fadden, great to see you. Good to see you. Uh, China, let's just start with China and Canada's particularly deteriorating relationship all centered around the telecom company Huawei and the detainment of their senior executive that, that happened uh, late last year. Um, what lingering effects does this have? We're caught again between the United States and China, not a great place to be. I think the government has to make a decision soon on, uh, on Huawei, if only because we have to make the bloody point can I say that on TV? You can say it. The bloody point that we're going to be the weakest link in the chain in the West amongst the five eyes, and that's not a desirable place for us to be. On the other hand, we have the Huawei executive who's being uh, kept in Canada. I don't think the Chinese are going to take very kindly to this. Uh, there have been a whole series of reports over the last little while about how China gets very irritated and takes very concrete action against yeah. countries that uh, don't meet with its approbation. I think the real issue here is not these particular issues, but that the West in general, Canada in particular, has not adjusted to this new operating environment. And we better do it soon because I don't think it's going to go back to the old ways. I think, the, I think the Canadian government, the Liberal government, has had a very brutal and hard lesson on China since they came mm. to power. They came to power hoping to negotiate a free trade agreement, hoping to uh, negotiate an extradition treaty, hoping to uh, sort of expand reach into China as a counter to the U.S. And they've had a, a very brutal run up against reality that China has power beyond what it imagined, but what Trudeau imagined, and, and is prepared to exercise exercise at hard power, right? And so now we're seeing at the end of the last year, we saw the effect on Canadians and, 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 and Canadian, not just individuals, but writ large businesses who were wondering, where's this all going? They, the government at the end of uh, last year was talking about sectoral agreements on trade yeah. still. All of that has gone by the wayside but, now. You know, they, the problem is the government does not have a discernible China policy. We need to see this government develop a policy that stands firm about not allowing them to have the kind of activities that they're doing in this country and, and stand with the United States and our allies against China well, well, from the way it's operating in the world. Correct. We did have a China policy, uh, but I'm afraid uh, the government has been forced to make decisions it didn't want to make. That, that's the problem they have. Mr. Trudeau had this naive hope that he could have some a kind of yeah, an economic... A policy naivety is not a policy. That, well, no, but their policy was to develop China uh, as an economic partner of Canada. We now see how impossible that is, uh, and they are coming to that realization, Sorry, I why think. Is that, why uh, is it maybe a free... I understand why a free trade deal is, is difficult, but isn't diversification, is isn't diversification with China essential, whether you're a conservative or whether you're a liberal? Isn't that just no, smart? I, I think China has ruined its reputation... Uh, as an acceptable uh, policy uh, partner in terms of economics. If every time they have a fight with an economic uh, opponent, uh, they put uh, some of their citizens in jail. They have lost tremendous credibility in the, uh, internationally. Their, their problem is they're always saying, we'll play by the rules when it's in our interests, but we're not going to play by them uh, when oh, it's not. Actually, okay, I, I just think it's naive to think that we can shut the door on China altogether. Right. And I do think it's naive to think that there can be no engagement with but China. But nobody's arguing that. No, okay, no, no. well, that's just Absolutely so we're clear. Yeah. But to Craig's point, while we have to maintain relationships with China, it is a significant mistake, in my view, for Canada to put too many eggs in one basket. And we started off with Mr. Trudeau and his government fixating on China. We're still somewhat fixated on it. We have to diversify. I mean, it complicates Minister Carr's job, 
But we, in an economic sense, we have to diversify. We have to stop thinking that China is going to solve all of our economic and trade problems. Okay. Uh, so let's say in the new year, Dick, you're suggesting that they absolutely ban Huawei from participating in the fifth generation, the 5G mm -hmm. rather, the next generation of uh, wireless. That'll be interesting to see. Let me turn to Saudi Arabia because that's another big policy. Bob, let me start with you on that. Um, already we've got some sanctions against, you know, 17 members of the Saudis. Uh, we're still selling light armored vehicles there. It's an election year. Uh, there's jobs at stake in London, Ontario, hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, $15 billion contract. What is the government, does this become an election issue? What do they do on this Well, file? look, if they cancel that contract, they're going to lose their seats in the London, Ontario area for sure. Uh, I don't think there, uh, there's a, a moral argument for why are we selling arms to Saudi Arabia for sure, but we've now, we, we've, we've agreed to put morality aside to sell them the arms. and. We all know that if you cancel that, they're just going to buy the arms from one of our allies, the Germans or the Americans. So we have to be very careful about that. Nobody's going to be hurt except all of those people who are dependent on those jobs. I think we forget it for the moment, uh, and I think that's the way the government is going, dragging its feet and not canceling that contract and just avoiding having any other sort of military connections with that country, with Saudi Arabia, when they can avoid it, and they can avoid it a lot. But nobody's going to be hurt except the people that need that work. Although and so I think we should st keep sending the damn things to the... Uh, to the Mr. Soviet. Trudeau did tell me that they are looking for ways to end it. I don't know if they will, but he's been floating that. But it seems to me that the most fundamental question that Canada should ask itself, do we wish to export arms anyway, anywhere? If you're exporting arms, be it to Saudi Arabia or anywhere else, they are going to be used. That is why they are being purchased. So if we're going to make a policy decision that we don't want to export to Saudi Arabia, why shouldn't it apply to any number of other Canadian companies that are exporting arms? I think the other consideration that hasn't been raised here in terms of Canada's dealing with Saudi Arabia is twofold. First of all, Saudi is a huge Western ally in the Middle East in some regards in pushing back against Iran's influence. And secondly, Canada has citizens uh, and interests yeah. in protecting human rights in Saudi Arabia, right? And so that's a big factor weighing into how Canada deals with Saudi Arabia. Uh, before, okay, I, I want to get to meddling in the election because you're here and you have a special insight into that. Mm -hmm. We have a federal election. It's been the dominant story in the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. Russia's alleged meddling in that election. How concerned, Dick Fadden, are you that our election will be subject to some kind of foreign influence meddling? I think we should be as concerned as anybody else in the West. It's not just the United States, although the story there has been much hotter. The French and the British and the Germans have all said they've seen meddling in their elections. I can see no rationale for concluding that we will not be the subject of meddling as well. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? And there's all sorts of meddling, you know, going from web website modifications to paying people off to everything else. I don't think that the reports that was issued by the government by CSEC is, is comprehensive enough. Uh, I'm not sure the legislation that we have in place deals with all of this. But it goes to the issue again of fake news. This is a different version of fake news, and we haven't come to grips with it yet. And Dick, uh, again, we're just about to take a break. Your con on the foreign policy file, your biggest flag, red flag for Dick Fadden in 2019, what are you looking for? I think it's going to be how it's going to go with China. And I think one of the issues with China is we, don't, we haven't developed a comprehensive policy encompassing trade and economics, strategic, right. uh, and security. We can, no government can deal with China without combining all of the three and coming up with a comprehensive policy. That's, I think, Craig, where they've failed to act in the past. They need a comprehensive policy with China, which right. involves involvement. <laughs> which involves involvement. Mm. All right, uh, Dick Fadden, thank you for joining us.